Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Politics in the Pub. My name is Howard Bell. Well done coming out in the middle of the rain. Like, it shows that you have a commitment to the issue which is uh, on our agenda tonight, which is homelessness. Um, the thing that really worries me is that in Australia we still have this uh, national disgrace of a statistic of 120, 105,000 homeless people across Australia. That was the 2006 census. Um, and uh, it just gets, it, 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 go, it goes from bad to worse. So, um, and Canberra can throw money at it, but it doesn't seem to help. The figure just keeps going up and up and up. And in terms of politics, neither side of politics seems to have a rigorous policy on how to uh, address the issue, how to uh, make it better, and how to reduce homelessness. But the fact that we have even just one homeless person in the streets of any of the cities of Australia tonight is a national disgrace. And every elected parliamentarian of both sides of politics and the Greens, they all should be chronically ashamed. But of course they're not. And uh, that's an indicator that Canberra just doesn't get it. That's why whenever we uh, are putting together the Politics in the Pub program, we uh, like to spend an evening on this particular topic. Years ago, when I was very new to politics in the pub, somebody called Vanessa Carley spoke about homelessness. And she was then uh, on the board of Cana Communities. Um, I hadn't heard of Cana Communities prior to that. I now know a lot about Cana Communities, um, and uh, they do some great work. And um, I was... Um, last night in one of the Cana shelters and I grabbed some of these. I'm just going to make these available for anybody who wants one. It's like a little bit of a brochure about what Cana Communities does. Um, and they do some great work. But, ladies and gentlemen, let me say this, that there are two other organisations who do stellar work. And I don't use the word stellar very often. But they, these two organisations, Homelessness New South Wales and Shelter New South Wales, do stellar work. And we are very, very privileged tonight to have the uh, uh, respective leaders of those two organisations, Catherine McKernan and Mary Perkins. Um, you might recall about this time last year we devoted the evening to homelessness and we had, uh, uh, we had Gary Moore, um, who was then the CEO of Homelessness New South Wales, and we had Sister Anne Jordan from the Canaan communities, and we had a gentleman um, who was himself homeless, who told the story uh, from, from a first principles perspective. And that doesn't seem like a year ago, because what on earth has happened in 2015? It's just evaporated. What I'd now like to do is to introduce our two guest speakers. I could spend two hours introducing them because they're both such amazing people. So the information I'm going to share with you by way of introduction is just a very brief summary of the, uh, the things that these people do and the things that they have done um, prior to occupying their current positions. Mary Perkins, um, who was here earlier this year, and uh, wonderful to have you back, Mary, at the Howard Park Hotel, is the Executive Officer at Shelter New South Wales, which is the state's peak advocate for housing justice. Shelter New South Wales unites the voices of low-income tenants and non-profit organisations working on their behalf. They conduct research and education on housing issues and they advocate to government to make housing more affordable and make the housing system work better for low income earners. Shelter New South Wales is a not-for-profit organisation or NGO and is not aligned with any uh, political party or commercial organisation. Mary's extensive work um, has included uh, significant effort in the area of organising, teaching and raising community awareness 
uh, through presentations, uh, including a lecture service on uh, urban issues and a large number of programs designed to advocate for and be the voice of the very vulnerable sector of uh, homelessness, uh, homeless people within the community. Well, I won't introduce you to Shelter New South Wales, as it's how it's already done that. I'll just start with, for us, the issue is about a fair housing system, and we have a very unfair one. But what does that mean? For us, it means that everyone can find their housing in the right place, at the right price, with the right amenity, and with the right degrees of security. Now, today, unaffordability and the unavailability of affordable housing in our major cities is causing a major crisis. <clears throat> our housing is being gentrified beyond blinking at. Um, that means it becomes more expensive. And it's raising the issue, as you know, we see um, cranes on every other corner as new housing goes up and redevelopment takes place. The issue is raised for us is, will there be a place for poorer people in our cities? Will there be a place for the homeless people that Catherine's trying to work out what needs to happen for? Will there be a place for the low-income working families? Will there be a place for people who are just poor um, or don't have you know, a lot of means behind them? And in looking for the way, in, in looking at the way in which Sydney and in fact many of the more prosperous cities in New South Wales along the eastern seaboard are developing, I had to look back a bit at some history. And that was looking at, you know, we know that the processes of economic and urban redevelopment have generally pushed poorer people around. They're usually the first cap off the rank to be the losers. And if you look back to Sydney in the 60s and the 70s, it, that time again was a time of huge urban redevelopment and reshaping. Um, <clears throat> we saw major roadway expansion, you know, the big expressways and all the stuff were happening then. And in fact, when you look at the maps they've got out today for West Connects, one wonders whether or not they just pulled the old maps out from the you know, end of the Ascan era and have reinstated some of those older plans that were shelved at the end of that period. Um, we saw institutions expand, the hospitals, the universities and what have you, and swallow up a lot of residential property. We saw the CBD expand and swallow up residential property. And we also saw the process of gentrification um, change the inner city from being one that was housing poor people to one that is housing incredibly rich people today. That whole period resulted in the loss of much of, most of, our lower priced private rental tenancy housing. And that housing has never been replaced anywhere else in this city. And that process that happened way back then in the 60s and 70s is one of the things that's at the basis of the shortage of accommodation we have today. Um, at that time, we also saw significant unrest. It didn't happen without a lot of community upheaval. So we saw significant opposition to the scale of the development that was taking place, the loss of communities, the loss of heritage, the aesthetics. Um, we saw a lot of resident action groups culminating in the Green Bands movement, which is all history now and all incredibly famous. But out of that unrest came a political settlement. We got our Environment and Planning Act, which is now being thoroughly reviewed and reworked. We got greater protection for heritage, for example, the rocks, Victoria Street, etc. We got a promise of tenancy law reform. And that back in those days, the tenants were being governed by a law that was a 19th century law. It took us another 10 years to get the reform that was needed. Um, we also saw significant parts of Woolloomooloo and Glee being passed into public ownership. We saw the preservation of public housing in the inner city and the growth of some of it. We also saw the growth of public housing estates in Western Sydney, mainly being created to house the low-income families being displaced from their inner city. Um, we also saw in the new Planning Act something quite significant, an inclusionary zoning was allowed, which meant that you had to build, or you could build, councils could adopt to build and to require of developers that part of new development should include affordable housing. We saw local councils, Waverley, North Sydney, Sydney and Willoughby, adopt those schemes. Unfortunately, since those days, we've seen successive planning ministers on both sides block any attempt by other councils to use those parts of the Planning Act. Um, today, we see another whole range of developments taking place, and this time something a bit different is happening. 
the land being looked at for redevelopment and being snaffled is that land that was you know protected at the time it's the public housing estates the public housing in wood locations we also see the in the redevelopment process the properties owned by poorer people being up for grabs so in parliament last week they passed legislation that will enable developers to in effect force private citizens to sell their housing to them. Um, you know, I remember when the Strata Acts were first introduced in the late 60s and 70s, the issue then was that the introduction of Strata was causing the loss of some low income housing. In effect, back then, to put it quite simply, government was saying to people, well, here's your chance to have a go at that thing called home ownership. Here's a cheaper form of it because you can own a part of this. And now they're saying, well, it doesn't suit us anymore. We actually want that land you're on. So we'll pass this legislation to make it easier for developers to get access to it. Um, so we see quite a lot of threats to normal people, to poorer people's housing. Um, <clears throat> we're told the city has to grow by, I can't remember what the thousands are in the ads, but many thousands. Um, and But no real discussion about how this city is to grow, how it's to grow so that it has inclusions for people so that it involves all of us to all of us get the benefit of whatever the growth is going to bring um, and what we see in our housing side of things that is simply not being addressed in our whole housing system is in both our private markets and our public markets there is a real crisis um, in our private rental markets and in the home ownership market both our private rental markets or both our private markets rather there is real issues with affordability and accessibility. There's a shortage of in New South Wales of in excess of 100,000 units of accommodation for low and moderate income households. Nationwide, it's up over half a million. That figure is growing all the time. It's not fixing. Um, and if we look at the characteristics of our private markets, it's a story that's well known, but when you piece it together, you can t tell how sort of overwhelming it is in a way. House prices for purchase and for rental have increased faster than incomes over the past decade. This has placed home ownership beyond the reach of many potential or traditional first home owners. There's also been a significant increase in the number of investors in the housing market, generally investing in higher priced, priced newer stock and often leaving it empty because they're only interested in the asset and a capital gain rather than its use value. The exclusion of the first home buyers in favour of investors has led to increased proportion of households renting. However, there's been a substantial reduction in the proportion of rental housing with rents at the lower end of the market. We've been through a period of growth. Governments of both colours have always told us that what we needed is growth, and if we got growth, more housing starts, that would flow on to prices. We've now been through a significant couple of years of new housing starts and housing growth, if you like but we haven't seen anything but worsening housing affordability. The trickle-down market effect doesn't work, and for other reasons, as I'll spell out later. Um, the reasons for this unprecedented period of house price inflation are well known, they've been well documented, it's no secret, um, and both our political parties are incredibly well aware of them. They've been documented by Ken, Ken, Ken Henry, I nearly called him King Henry, but Ken, Ken Henry in his review of our tax system. And the cycle is simple. It goes like this. Investors bid up the cost of our housing in the expectation of capital gains. This leads to operating, operating losses arising from higher debt servicing costs, which in, then in turn requires higher returns, higher prices to get returns. And it's underpinned by our tax system. It's underpinned by negative gearing, which allows deductibility of losses um, for the investment and by a concessional capital gains tax and it's, it's very clear from the stuff that Henry has done that the introduction of the 50% capital gains tax discount in 1999 combined with negative gearing led to the very sharp increase in prices that we've seen. So you know, at this point it's got nothing to do with free market forces or anything else like that but all to do with government tax policies. Um, also, contributing to this scenario are a number of other factors, including financial deregulation that enabled people to get access to more and more debt, 
the more you can borrow, the more the prices go up. And that's been quite simple. And we've seen the really scary prospect, housing debt relative to disposable income has grown from around 40% of disposable income at the beginning of the 1990s to 160% in 2006, and it's stayed there ever since. Another factor contributing to the increase in house price is overconsumption of housing. Our houses have grown. We've seen a real overinvestment in owner-occupied housing. The size of the dwellings has increased substantially, even though the number of people occupying the houses has gone down. And the main reason for this has been the exemption of the family home from the capital gains tax. Instead of being the family home, the owner-occupied housing is now a major source of wealth creation for people lucky enough to be in the system. It means we have a system now in terms of wealth that is a winner takes all. If you're on the ladder and you're there, you're doing very nicely. But if you're trying to get there and get there without inherited wealth or family assistance, good luck to you. In our social housing system, we see another set of scenarios, and it's linked. Our housing system as a whole, it's linked by different economic forces. You can't just do what our governments do and package this there and package that there. If you want substantial change and you want to have it working fairly for everybody, you need to deal with it as a whole. So this period of house price inflation has had a very serious impact on our social housing system in two ways. One, it increases the demand for social housing. Many more people are doing it tough in the private markets. Then, secondly, it makes it prohibitively expensive for our social housing providers to buy the stock necessary to meet the demand. And then when you combine that with 20 years of decreased funding for our social housing system, it becomes pretty nightmarish. And we've seen a number of changes, you know, and the nightmarish is we've now got a waiting list of approximately 60,000 households. That, can I say, is a waiting list that's curtailed by and shaped by very, very stringent eligibility criteria. That waiting list once hit over 100,000. Governments responded. Every time the waiting list gets politically unacceptable, governments respond with a round of rationing and tightening of eligibility criteria. So in a way, that waiting list has nothing to do with what the need is out there in the community. It's simply an indication of who might be eligible for a very, very tightly rationed thing. Because of the lack of growth in our public housing system over the last 20 years, its role has changed so that it is now very tightly rationed to those who are most in need rather than a mix of those most in need and low income working families or just people on low incomes, what have you. It's now seen as a transitionary form of housing between what you need now because you're in a bit of a crisis and where you might end up. Um, rather than the place that could be your secure place called home until you wanted to change that. <coughs> As a consequence of the real serious funding reductions and this targeting and the tightening of public housing its eligibility to the needy of the most needy, is in a way, spitting them in the bum in a way, because it seriously erodes their operating revenue. The way housing is funded is from tenants' rents and some other subsidies that come through from government. But it was the, the whole way in which it was the formula for working it out, I guess, was a certain percentage of tenant rent had to be or was used for its operating costs. So the more that the product, the more it was targeted to the needy of the most needy and only had room for them the revenues from rents went down and went down and went down. And no one funded the difference between what it cost to run the system and what it cost and what they were actually raising in rents. So as a consequence, no new stock was purchased. The old stock was no longer being turned over because they didn't have the means to do that. And once upon a time, low-income working families could <coughs> purchase their housing commission home, but what that meant was you had a constant turnaround so that older stock was being purchased and newer stock was replacing it. That replacement process no longer took place. The maintenance became a nightmare and our housing commissions across the country did what poor people do. They behaved just like poor people. They put the maintenance off hoping the rainy day would end. The rainy day has never ended and it doesn't look like it's going to. So we've got a lot of property in pretty poor condition. Um, that hasn't had sufficient funds allocated to it for maintenance, but because it, because of the, I guess, I'm, I'm reluctant to point fingers at the housing commissions for their 
all the housing departments as they now are for their work because the funding formulas that funded them didn't allow them to actually provide properly for the long-term maintenance of that property. And that's because of the way the targeting happened and that no one funded the rental, the difference between what it cost and what tenants were paying um, and the rental subsidy. In addition, we've got a whole pile of housing estates across the country, not just in New South Wales, but across the country, that were built on the assumption that public housing was about housing low-income families. We're now not housing low-income families at all. We're housing largely single people, older people, and people with highly specialised needs. And that old housing stock isn't particularly useful to them. It's sort of out of sync. So we've got this whole mix of a system that doesn't meet people's needs particularly well um, until you ask the tenants. When you ask the tenants, as we have done, what they value about public housing or social housing, to this day they will say, we will forgive you the maintenance and repairs, we will forgive you the difficulty of living next door to neighbours who can't always keep it together and the neighbourhood disputes that come out of that, etc. We'll trade all of that because we know that the security of tenure we have is so valuable and the closer they are to living in the private rental market and its insecurities, the more they value that security. So it's not something I would slam as a product that or as a former housing that isn't useful. It's extremely useful and extremely valuable to the people who live in it. There just isn't enough of it. Um, now, in 2013, our Auditor General investigated all of the problems in our social housing system and he projected that it was going to grow, or the demand for it was going to grow by 14% in the next, or well, the five years up to 2016. And he offered a number of solutions. They did what governments do, or what you know financial people do. They looked at the value of the land, and they said, it's got to manage within its means, it's got assets, it's got to somehow trade those assets, make those assets work harder. They might be lazy assets. Now, you know, that suggests that you need to borrow to make good and all of that sort of stuff. Now, borrowing is all well and good if you've got the means to pay the debts back. All debts have to be paid in some shape or form. So it became very clear to us that one of the things they were going to start to do was try to work out the value of the land and work out how to unleash that. Um, we're expecting now a social housing policy. We know that the department is working on it to come out in the near future. We expect it to maintain the very narrow focus they currently have about the role of social housing in our housing system. And we have huge and significant concerns about that. We're also expecting them to come out with an asset portfolio strategy of some sort. Um, and it will have something to do with unleashing the value of the land. And we've had a fairly good indication of recent times, including the announcements made in the last week or so, that that's going to involve the redevelopment of older housing estates and with public-private type partnership arrangements in a range of ways, replacing older stock with newer stock, but in very mixed communities. Some of that might be good, some of that might be hard. My question will be again, as it was for the Millers Points tenants, is how is it going to happen so that the tenants actually get a say in their future and that it isn't um, justifiably hard in the way that it treats them and the communities that they live in. Want some respect here and some working with people. Um, so we're sort of looking forward to seeing some of those documents and to participating in that. But our overarching comments about the sort of direction our government has been heading is if we have a social housing policy, a social housing system that is focused only on addressing the needs of the very, very low income households. What, what happens to the rest of people? Um, doesn't mean that others aren't doing it tough and don't need some policies, processes and services to assist them. We've noted with concern that the assumptions behind the policies coming out from government are that it's possible for people to be housed in our private markets, and most notably our private rental market, in a sustainable way. Now, remember back to the beginning of my talk when I talked about some of the things in our private markets, it's very clear to us that Blind Freddy should be able to see that you cannot expect our private markets with the current policy settings to provide secure, long-term, affordable housing to low-income households. It simply ain't going to happen. And expecting that to happen is... It just means that increasing numbers of households will be in very tenuous circumstances and at the risk of homelessness. We know from 
work that's been done to date that for many households there's a very, very short period of time between being at work, being able to pay the rent, getting sick, losing your job or some disaster happening and being street homeless. It's a very fast track these days because of the price of our private rental housing and the lack of any sort of breaks around it. Um, so that sort of policy setting has us and I'm sure Catherine extremely worried because that just leaves too many people at really high risk. We also note with concern the way in which the assets are being considered. At one level they've been running this argument that says that, you know, how dare the people at Miller's Point live on such expensive land that isn't for poor people. We need that money so we'll liquidate that and move it somewhere else or what have you. We're very concerned about the way our city is dividing. If you talk to Bill Randolph from the City Futures Research Centre, he's got these maps of Sydney that map what's happened to Sydney and it's very, very clear now that Sydney has divided into areas of very rich and very poor and not much in between. Our income distribution has very sharply gone between you know, those at the top and those at the bottom and the middle, our middle classes have been hollowing out American stuff. Our city has been doing likewise. So the east, north, the north and the east and the northwest are rich. The west and the southwest are poor and incredibly poor. If you overlay that map about incomes and where people are living with what sort of incomes with a map about where the jobs are, and you'll see exactly the same pattern. People are being locked out of opportunities and being pushed. Our city 50 years ago wasn't like that. It was a very mixed community. This sort of trend we have real problems with. And economically, like if you want to just human-wise, that seems bad to me, but economically it ain't going to work either. You actually need a mixed city for it to work. You need people with all sorts of skills and what have you to be available to do the work to make the city function. Um, and already we know that on the North Shore of Sydney you can't get, it's very, very difficult to get home care workers and support workers and all of that. You know, sort of low key low paid workers who are working on split shifts and all of those sort of things because they can't afford to live near their jobs and they certainly can't afford to travel that sort of distance for that sort of work and those sort of hours. Um, just a little simple example of how difficult it gets when you don't have a plan for a mixed city. Um, and lastly, on the issue of equity, governments have been talking about equity and they talk about equity only within the social housing policy. They only talk about equity between the city and the public housing tenants. They pitch one bunch of poor people against another bunch of poor people. They don't talk about equity in our housing system. And this bit makes me really angry because when you break down where the subsidies go in our housing system, and when you go back to looking at the way the tax system benefits people, the real and serious subsidies in our housing system actually are administered through the tax system to increasingly wealthy people. It's a very similar argument to what the argument going on about where the super subsidies, superannuation subsidies will go at the minute. So if we're talking about equity, we want tax on the table and we want serious tax reform that treats our housing system much more fairly and lets everybody get a share of the benefits. Now, at Shelter's level, we've been doing a bit of work about, you know, it's the constant propaganda campaign really, about trying to get things out to people so they understand them and can start to push their politicians and influence wherever they can influence. We're about to, at the end of this month, beginning of December, come out with our, um, it'll be an 11 point plan, 10 point plan, 11 point plan, something or another point plan. Um, but the guts of it's going to be, we want a solid commitment from anybody who's serious about housing to increasing the supply of social and affordable housing in New South Wales by 100,000 units over the next 10 years, 2,000 of those per year to be in the social housing sector. We want to see a serious increase in the capacity of organisations to respond to homelessness, an increase in the capacity of our Aboriginal community housing organisations to meet the needs of their communities, we want an expansion of the dwellings available for older people and people with disabilities. And we recognise that this will require new ways to finance rental housing. There's been a thousand reports or whatever, there's enough information out there, there's a range of ways of doing that. That's not going to be rocket science to sort that out. You could even just take our existing tax settings and say, OK, negative gearing is fine. You can negative gear your investment property, but in return, us, the taxpayers, want a commitment from you that the property will be an affordable rental property for a long-term lease. Um, so there's ways you can jig that current system to make that happen. 
We want tax reform so that our housing system in each of its tenure forms is treated neutrally, so they no longer have one form of housing that is not just the place called home, but is the major wealth creation. And it's sort of a, it's a bit of a waste of effort in a way because that the amount of funds that go into you know our home ownership sector, a lot of that investment would be better placed in more productive parts of our economy, creating activities and jobs and all the rest of it, rather than just passively sitting there in an asset that is largely benefiting from the tax settings. Um, we want to see a system where the windfall gains that developers get in developing a shared back. So, for example, when the best way of explaining this is when government rezones land for a different purpose, like you know higher densities, so you can suddenly put a ten storey, you know, building on a the proper land where it used to be, you know, two storeys. Um, there's a significant uplift in the value of that land. That developer's done nothing. The owner of that land has done nothing to gain that benefit. Government has created that wealth by simply rezoning the land. So we're saying where somebody benefits from such a value uplift as a result of government action in rezoning the land, some of that benefit has to come back to the community by way of affordable housing. So we want that sort of sharing of gains. We also want our urban redevelopment processes to very explicitly include targets for affordable housing. And we've sort of talked around at least a minimum of 15% of any development being affordable housing. That's simply to ensure that all of us get a chance to benefit from the, you know, whatever the benefits are that come from a, a, the urban redevelopment that's taking place and to ensure that this city does have place for everybody. We also want protection for the public housing estates in high value areas and the public housing in high value areas. Public housing is a really crucial thing at this point in time not just for the people who live in it, but to preserve the mixed nature of our city. When you break down the city of London and look at the way in which it's developed, not dissimilar to Sydney on a different scale, they have a much more mixed economic or diversity in their city. And when you break down why that's happened, it's happened because of the role of their council housing. The council housing has kept that city in a fairly mixed way that Sydney is going to lack big time. Um, we want to make our rental housing more secure, which means substantial law reform, and there's currently a review of our Residential Tenancies Act. And our last point is we want mechanisms that will seriously prevent the loss of low-cost housing or low, uh, low housing for lower-income people in our private markets, be it the Strata example or other sorts of dwellings. So we want to prevent the loss of what's currently there that's affordable, unless it's being explicitly replaced with something else. And I'll just finish up with... Shelters are an advocacy organisation. I invite you all to consider joining us. You know, it's not expensive, but we actually need members. We need people who want to join us in order to contribute and in order to build an organisation capable of arguing for a fair and just housing system. So it's really what you can do by indicating support for us rather than, you know, you're not joining members and us to get something. You're joining in order to give something. So I've got membership forms here, I'll pass them around, but it would be really great if people felt like they could um, consider joining us.